So I'm going to make a quick video about my three favorite parts about the New Testament Bible, King James Version of the Bible. Um, I think I may have slightly touched on them in some of my videos, but I didn't really get to talk, of them, about, talk about them being my favorite things. Um, and I'll go ahead and say my four favorite things. So the fourth favorite thing is probably... Um, Paul being the most influential apostle of the New Testament. And also, before he became an apostle of Christ, he was arguably one of the worst human beings on earth. He was killing men, women, and children that said they believed in Jesus Christ. And he was telling other people to do the same. And he, like, had control over army, army men. And, like, they were just bad people. And... Jesus spoke to him and he had a choice to listen to Jesus' words and go and find an apostle and learn what Jesus was about or he could burn in hell for all eternity. And when he found a person, he that person blessed him and I, I believe he's actually, I said in a lot, one of the other videos that he was made dumb to where he couldn't speak for three days but I actually believe he was, now I think about it, he was made blind and he couldn't see for three days until he met this apostle that blessed him and healed him. And, yeah, so the fact that, like, the worst man can become one of the best men. And it's interesting because Paul is a lot of the writings, a lot of the books that you'll find in the New Testament have writings from Paul and thoughts that were from Paul's teachings. And... There's a part in the Bible where he talks about his wickedness and he talks about like the sins that he committed makes him unworthy to be to be a man that could become one with Jesus and fulfill some type of prophecy and that instead he should leave these words for a different time when such a man might be ready to hear these words and that although Paul went around and made blessings, healing the dead, and, um, hang on, and basically, he, he goes into some of the writing and he talks about how like everybody on this earth is a sinner and so was he and that even a sinner can wield the power of God and that like the whole the whole point of the New Testament is that one day there's going to be a person who comes and wields the power of God again because it's left the earth um, this isn't actually one of my favorite things but I found it very very interesting and it's hang on now is that the Bible talks about like this end time where it's going to be, it's going to like nations versus nations, every, every, like wars happening and then daughters turning against fathers and mothers and sons and all these different things, right? And if you look around the world, like, I mean, the world was never perfect, but if you look in the measures of which the Bible speaks, like it looks like the world's never been worse. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a huge part of the Bible where Paul talks about how everybody on earth is a sinner and that the only person that will be able to hide from their sins is the person that redeems themselves by finding Christ all on their own and just, just um, becoming, becoming one with Jesus. And that everyone else will have to answer for all the times that they judged other people, all the times that they didn't turn the other cheek, all the times that they praised some other idol or false god other than Jesus Christ. Um, all, all of that's gonna gonna be real, and yeah, I mean, just the whole story of Paul and his testament of the power of God and what one can do with it and I mean how relatively simple it is to obtain it is quite remarkable um, and it's interesting that he says that he's unworthy to finish 
something. And if you if you if you think about what the Bible is trying to talk about as you're reading it, and then you ask yourself what was Paul saying he was unworthy to do? It wasn't to die for our sins because that's not what we needed. What we needed was for somebody to come and be Jesus on earth and heal the world and condemn the wicked and bring God's presence back to earth. That's what we need. That's what the Bible talks about coming. And we often hear it referred to as Jesus Christ's second coming. But if you read the Bible and Paul's words about his own sins and wickedness, it's that a sinful person will become this person. And that it's, it's necessary for this person to become a sinner so that he can be a proper judge and understand that even sinners deserve um, forgiveness as long as they meet the minimum standards of God. Which is one, worship your Christ as your Savior and Lord for all time and eternity and love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's like the first, that's like a whole sum, summaration of my fourth favorite part of the Bible. Now, if I had to choose my third favorite part of the Bible, I would say it is the fact that after Jesus died, he was resurrected and for 40 or so days, he went around talking to 500 people that believed in him. And so he'd go to groups of people that he knew had love for him and he would speak to them. And of these 500 people, in the New Testament, there's about 12 or so apostles um, even after his crucifixion and even after some of the apostles were killed, there were still at least a handful um, around preaching about Jesus. And my third favorite part is that after Jesus was resurrected and proved his, um, proved his power, it fulfilled the faith of the apostles and apostles began to um, have no fear of any miracle to be able to perform. So there are many records of um, testament testimonies of apostles healing the dead and the sick and the um the ones infested with demons whatever you want to call it like whatever whatever problems were out there the apostles were going around teaching what the word of god was and then they were healing people and i don't feel like it's taught very well in the churches that jesus when jesus died it wasn't like the power of god left the earth and i find that i find that intentional um, when I read the New Testament and then I see how the churches are teaching, I find it all to be intentional of what, of how they're misleading everyone. And yeah, I'm, I'm not happy with Christians at all. Not at all. Um, it, it seems to me as though people, everyone's faith is off somebody else's word and somebody else's teaching that they learned from someone else rather than their own studies and personal testimony of the New Testament, which is all anybody ever needs. If that was the only book on earth, like, life would be good. Life would be very good. Oh, so, what is my second most favorite part? Well, I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm not sure which one's my first and which one's my second, but they're basically the same story. And I believe they were actually different apostles that um, were a part of the story for both times. Um, but it was the after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection and he's left. And it's in the book of Acts. And there's two moments where there are philosophers and educated elite people that are in large groups and they're having open civil debate about who is God, what is purpose of life, all these beautiful things, right? And they just want an answer. Um, one of them might have been they were having this conversation already and somebody like said, hey, you guys should let these people speak of their God um, named Jesus. And then I think another one was that there was a leader or somebody who said who knew about Jesus and knew this guy was a apostle of Jesus and said I want my people to hear this 
or and it may not have been his people or something, but he had the power to get him an audience and he thought the audience should hear these words. And I'll have to go back to Acts to find the exact chapters and exactly what was said. But in both of these stories, well, we'll start with one of the stories. So, well, I guess we'll tell them both. But basically, it's the same thing. The question is, what is the purpose of life? And both the apostles answer it basically in the same way. And the goal is to say it as plainly as possible. And the idea is what the apostles message is when they have one chance to speak in front of people that have never heard this word before and they want them to hear one thing they say brothers and sisters we are from a single god there is but one god and that god like we've heard stories about through the old testament and we know the old testament laws and we've we've heard the traditions And recently, God had sent his son, Jesus Christ, who was a perfect child, to be sacrificed so that we may all be found innocent in the eyes of God. And if we but have faith that Jesus is the one and only Lord that we should worship and idolize and praise with all of our thoughts, days, and time, and do like he would, and love, the, love our neighbor in ways that he would, then ye would be blessed with the power of God and you will be saved into eternal life for eternity. For all eternity. And then, what's interesting is right before they get into the part of where like the rest of the whole New Testament begins to preach about like how one man is going to find Jesus and this one man who overcomes is going to inherit the kingdoms of earth. Like the in these stories, both times before they could finish and say what they needed to say, the message gets subtly hidden and they say they were cut short and they were... They leave in a hurry because anger and rumors begin to gather in the crowds. Because when this message is spoken and when people are told there is only one way to to, to heaven and eternal life and there's only one way to obey God and that this message is around Jesus Christ, it threatens the establishment of everything else that exists on this earth. Doesn't matter if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a school teacher, if you are a policeman, if you are a judge, if you are like a business owner, it does not matter. The fantasy in which you guys live in and have created based on money and manly idols is going away it's all like it's changing and it's my way or the highway and what i love is two things about the bible so we'll say that's my second favorite thing and then i'll say the last favorite thing about the bible is those two stories of when they had one chance to speak what did they say to the world that there has always only been one god that he sent here sent us here as a test that we might love and praise him so that we might gain eternal reward. And that Jesus came and died for our sins so that if we do everything else necessary, then even though we are sinners, we can still be seen worthy in the presence of God because we have repented and we ceased to sin and then we did the works, which is faith. Baptism, laying on of hands, all these important things, all the things that Jesus did, and more. Because, well, except for the person who meets Jesus face to face in the last days and becomes Jesus himself, as far as everyone is concerned, except for that guy, 
Um, there are definite laws that have been written and ordered to be God's law that men should follow. And it's not too complicated. For the most part, Mormons got it right. Um, I mean, Joseph Smith was definitely a prophet of God, and Joseph Smith definitely saw me coming. And Joseph Smith, like John, was in the Bible to preach about Jesus coming. Joseph Smith was restored restored the God's church in America after America was made a free nation, and he prophesied of a second comforter coming, and guess what? It's me. And so... That's pretty great about the Bible. Um, maybe the best part about the Bible, though, is that it says the person who's coming as the second comforter, as Christ. Paul is very specific about this um, in 1 Corinthians. He says this person is coming with power. That this is not... This is not somebody that will... That you will be happy to be in charge of you. That it will be hard for m many of you to soften your hearts and understand that the anger, the feroc ferocity, the the uh, I mean the calmness and kindness and the, like if you if you can listen past the parts you don't like, you eventually find out that the parts that you do like are are are, are worth it first of all, but then you also understand that like, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the person who wants to be the second coming of Christ has to be, like, soft in their heart so much that they understand that they are going to be a servant for all eternity. And that this sinful man who loves plenty of sin as much as the next person, like, finds just as much joy and satisfaction as the sins that we commit because and continue to commit because they are pleasurable. Like, I get it. But this person got to be first off willing to just put that aside and say, I'll never do that again. And if I do, like, my soul be damned for all eternity. And then there's a certain amount of time that they got to do this while combining their practice for faith. But that when you do this, that you will be given God's power. And so basically, I'm at this point where I, like, I know I haven't sinned in a decent amount of time, at least a couple weeks. And that's if you're judging by a very strict standard. And it could take a whole year. Like, how long do you got to not sin before Jesus is like, all right, bro, like, you proved to me that, like, you, you, you're, you're sincere about this. Like, this ain't just a, a temporary phase. You're not just finding the gospel and getting a little um, endorphin kick out of it and then letting it fade away, right? Like, like how long that's going to be? I'm not sure. But as somebody who doesn't live in sin, like I can easily go a year not living in sin. And I could probably go two years and I could probably go longer than that without ever hearing a word from Jesus or God or anything else or an angel or anything. Like that's what's, that's what's interesting is that in order for the plan to be perfect, like God can't come and guide me to being the next Jesus. Otherwise that wouldn't be perfect. That wouldn't be a sinful man truly coming unto Christ and giving up his life and his heart and his soul for the purpose that Jesus might wield it and perfect this broken world. Like, if you think about all of it, you're going to see that the only way that this person could be worthy of, of King of Kings, Lord of Lords type of title, King of the Jews type of title, is if he earned it all by himself. And just through just pure hope that there was something in this world that would allow me to, to make it a better place. And honestly, like if men weren't so evil, if, if the scriptures weren't so true about a house divided against itself shall always fall, like there's no way this world can exist for eternity human human civilization cannot prosper for eternity under the the rule of men because you like it's just you're all so bad so sinners like even the good ones like you'd eventually destroy yourselves given the power given the opportunity like just none of you are ready for it
And that's why we live in a crappy world like we do today. So again, the second coming, like the, I guess the nice part for you is that you don't have to worry about it until you see somebody actually doing something that seems magical that you can't explain and you see that nobody else can explain. Like that should be your first step from saying, okay, who is this person and is he real or is he fake? And you understand the Bible says that in the last days there's going to be kings appointed that will perform miracles and they will be false antichrists. And so definitely be disciplined in, in who you trust. But ultimately, eventually, you're going to see that it is me, the only one worthy. And what I need you to do when you know, I, is, I don't know. I don't have the, like, the only real answer is to just read the New Testament and have faith until you literally have the power of God. I would say that every, every choice you make in your life, the answer is in the New Testament. If you ever have a question of should I do this or should I do that, read the entire New Testament at least one time through and you will find your answer in there every single time, guaranteed. There's so much to learn in all of the books so much repeated in such different ways that if you didn't understand it the first time, you might get it the next time. Um, yeah, favorite parts about the Bible. What else is great about the Bible? Um, Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, the last thing I'd say is Revelations 12. There's a video with a YouTube um, channel. It's called Gospel Lessons. And they made this video two years ago. And if you go all the way back to the very first video that they made called Revelations 12, sign on September 23rd, 2017, what you're going to see is a... What you're going to see is a 30-minute video. And in this video, you're going to see an explanation about how basically there's a star alignment that has only happened twice in the last 5,000 years. And it requires different constellations and different planets in our solar system to be all in certain spots as well as the sun and the moon. And it's basically 1 in 65 million chance that it, would ha it could happen. And the estimated number of days since this was this prophecy was written um, is roughly like 700,000 days. And so out of 700,000 days, the sign that would be seen in the stars of heaven has happened twice. And they were like per day is one in 65 million chance. And so if you look at the math that way it's basically an impossibility to expect that it would happen once in this amount of time let alone twice but then more importantly when you go and you look at what actually happened it's quite incredible and basically when this sign is seen in the stars like i, I agree with gospel lessons theory that it represents the time and moment when Satan was at its strongest and every day from this sign the Sa Satan will get weaker until a great event happens and the, the beautiful part is that it explains it once and then it shows what happens and like if you watch the video of the Gospel Lessons YouTube channel you're going to see that like how the scripture actually talks about the child being the church of God and Joseph Smith restoring the church of God on earth and how it was preserved six years later by a miraculous greatest meteor shower ever seen in a night um, which led an army that was dead set on killing all Mormons they could find um, to cower in fear and feel like they were doing something wrong because just on the night that they planned to do it there happened to be the greatest meteor shower of all time 
and this was about six years and two or three months after um, the sign was seen for the first time. So basically, the sign is seen, Joseph Smith starts writing the Book of Mormon, and then um, the church is established, and then right as Satan is looking the most powerful, ready to destroy, having already killed many Mormon mission, uh, members and all this stuff, like right at that time when they're ready to finish the job and eliminate the last ones, the meteor shower happens and the church is saved. They're able to flee west and eventually become one of the largest churches on earth and then most importantly, one of the wealthiest churches on earth. Um, I don't know if that's most importantly, but like just the idea of if you look at how much good they've done um, as a community, like Mormons are definitely at the top. Not to say that they aren't guilty of many, many, many sins, because they are. But, um, there, yeah, so this sign happens in 1827, September 23rd. September 23rd happens to be my birthday. And the next day, Joseph Smith says that he got the plates from... Angel Moroni, which is recorded history. Again, whether you believe that he saw Angel Moroni or not, and whether you believe that Angel Moroni gave him the plates, the point is, like, he went and told everyone that this is what happened. And there's so much history and writings about Mormons, whether it's journals from people or um, the things that are validated through, like, the legal systems and the, the the policemen that would like get warrants on Mormons and all these different things like hard factual evidence um, of a lot of just like the, the 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 stuff of what he was saying whether he was lying and on drugs or all these other things like that's up for you to decide but what's certain is that he said these things and that these dates are accurate and so again he gets the plates on September 22nd um, and he begins transcribing them on September 23rd the day that um, the stars align in the heavens and then after that six years and two months later boom something like the church looks like it's about to be destroyed but it's actually saved and it actually becomes like one of the most influential churches on the entire planet if you disagree with that you just aren't paying attention um and then most importantly is that Joseph Smith was like in my opinion uh, obviously a prophet of God but I didn't realize how much of the the hymns and everything talk about having Joseph Joseph's spirit back in on this world again as it talks about the second coming and that Joseph Smith was the closest thing to Jesus Christ in 250 years, no doubt, let alone probably since John the Baptist. And he was sent to restore the church so that the church could breed people, a great and worthy and honorable and respectful and kind and loving people, that they could have me, like I could be born into the faith, and that I could turn away from it, which the New Testament says will happen. It says this person who's going to be the second Christ is going to go commit sin and try to, try to save the world in his own manly ideals, in his own ways. And that eventually he'll come unto Christ and realize that the only way is through Jesus. And it's been that way the whole time. And that had I come to Jesus sooner, then I could have, like... We probably didn't have to go through so much pain on this earth, but unfortunately, or fortunately, the way the Bible's written is that it is my job to judge, and I will come here and I will judge, and not everyone's going to be found innocent. And if you don't, if you feel it's offensive to call me Jesus, there is no chance that you can be saved. You can call me Marcus, but you also better call me Christ. And that you don't have to call me Jesus. And we can all agree that Jesus is perfect and I never was. But I'm the one that who accepted his challenge of allowing us to be perfect in the eyes of God. So long we also have the necessary faith behind that perfection um, seen by Jesus' forgiveness. And so 
I'm not great because I'm not a sinner. I'm great because, so I'm not, I'm not great because I'm a sinner and I chose not to sin anymore, but I'm great. And the, the skill set that I have that none of you guys had was being able to have the necessary faith to find Jesus. And if you haven't seen like my work and my YouTubes and like the type of work that I did, which most like don't even consider work, but really is like the greatest work ever seen on in history of all mankind ever. Um, if you haven't seen that work, like you just know that like I basically have been trying to do what Jesus would have done had God not been real. Like, if this world is not godly, but, like, the Bible is here to teach us how to be good people and just make the world a better place, I was that guy. I was the guy that was going to come and make it to where the homeless were never homeless, the hungry were never hungry, and although they didn't get the best homes and although they didn't get the best food, they always got enough, and the people who worked and the people who earned would have got great vacations and had more than everybody else, but nobody would have been miserable and nobody would have been suffering. And for a lot of people, that was the problem. They need people suffering. And so there's a lot of evil people in this world. And if they're not seeing other people suffer, they're not happy. And it is my job. I was sent here to destroy all people who will not repent and continue in those ways. And so back to the story of the, the video that you're going to go watch at Gospel Lessons, um, the first video he ever produced. You're going to see that on September 23rd, the exact same calendar date, September 23rd, 2017, my 27th birthday, the sign in the stars of heaven was seen again, meaning shortly after Donald, President Donald J. Trump was elected president of the United States, Satan was at its most powerful point and that every day from that moment, Satan would get weaker until sometime within, I would say, the next seven years after that point, a great power of God is going to be witnessed. And unfortunately for everybody who doesn't love Jesus, is that when that sign is seen in heaven for the second time, it is suggesting that it is time for the return of Christ and that in six to seven years, you will see Christ reign on earth with the power of God again. So that means at the latest, September 23rd, 2024, you have better repented because trust me, you want to be one that found Jesus, that got baptized, that heard the word and accepted it as gospel truth in their own hearts. You want to be that person before I make it plain and obvious who I am. That's for sure. That's for sure, for sure. Um... Yeah, so the sign was seen again in 2017, and right now we're at 2023. If you go to the exact same amount of time, it would be November 13th of this year. That, was, that would be the same amount of time from the time we saw the sign to the time that we saw the greatest meteor shower ever witnessed. And so November 13th this year um, would suggest we could potentially see a pretty awesome sign but again, I figure it's probably give or take seven years. And so it could happen tomorrow and it could also happen um, by September 23rd, 2024. But I figure if I remain sinless until that date and I just keep on building on my faith and I have my hope that it can all be true and that I can save this world, well, I figure it's probably going to happen. So everyone can make their own bets. And we'll just have to see what happens. But I'm excited and I hope you are too.